Hi, this is Jeff Hillen with another Redfish School video, this one covering Redfish tasks. Um, as always, this video is a state of the art at the time it was recorded, and you should always check the DMTF Redfish website for the latest details on any uh, mock-ups and schema. Um, this video, I'm going to go over the task itself, with task overview, what it's really for. I'll go over the resources themselves and a map and then a couple of examples. So what is a task? It's an asynchronous operation. Really, that's all it is. Most operations in Redfish are synchronous. You're going to get a response right away. Um, but some operations may take longer, a firmware update or really any operation is allowed to be asynchronous you really don't know, and, and it could vary from implementation to implementation. So as a client, any time you see a 202, it could be on a get, particularly if you do an expand. It could be on a post. It could be on a patch. You really don't know. So any time you see a 202, this means a task has been started, and so you've got to do something a little bit different before you can get that JSON body back. When you get a 202, the location header, the HTTP header called location, has a URI of this thing called a task monitor. That's going to be the JSON body of the response when it's done. There may also be a retry after header to specify the amount of time you should wait before bothering to, to, to do a, a get on the task monitor. The response body that you get back when you get a 202 is not, like let's say you did a get of a computer system, it's not going to be the computer system resource. It's going to be a task resource. So you need to have a fork in your code that says, if HTTP operation is 202, don't go down the normal path, call this subroutine, and then come back. And, and that subroutine is largely what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so that ta subroutine is going to you know, monitor that, look at that task resource, check it out, maybe use it for getting and deleting, then do a get on the task monitor when everything's done, and use that as the body and the response to complete the rest of your code. Um, so what is a task monitor? Um, a task monitor is used by the client uh, to get the actual response body of the operation when it completes. Normally when you do a get, you get the response body has a whole payload of the get. Instead, that's going to come back in the task monitor. You can sit there and poll on the task monitor, and as long as you get a 202 on the task monitor uh, with no response body, you know the operation is still going. When, you, when it finishes, you won't get a 202 on the task monitor get. You'll get a 200 or a 400 if something aired or, or anything but a 202. So when it's finished, you get something other than a 202. And the body of that get operation on the task monitor is going to have what would have come back in the request had it been synchronous. So, you know, normally I do a get, I get a response. Um, that initial response, what would have come back as the initial response, instead of getting a task body back when I get a 202, I get from the task monitor, I'll get that original response body. So your code can then just pick up and keep going using that response body that you get back from the task monitor when you get a 200. So what's the task resource for then, right? I mean, gosh, why do you have that? Well, the task resource can be used by other entities other than the client to track the operation. You as the client, you had the permissions and you have access to that task monitor. But if there's an administrator somewhere else, it may not know that task monitor. And you probably don't want it to have access to that task monitor. But it may need to kill the request, right? You know, your session got hung up and you said, look, my job got started by accident. Go off and kill it and I don't have permission or something like that. It, some admin needs to be able to go in there and look and find that task and say, okay, I found it. I'm going to go ahead and kill it. And that's what the task resource is, is for. Canceling can be done, though by a delete on either one, either the task resource or the task monitor. So somebody does a delete operation, and they're all going to go away. Um, so the resources involved, really, you got a task service. That's the service that's going to be doing the task, and it's got a bunch of attributes on its own, such as an overwrite policy and the status of the task service. Maybe the task service is hung up. Who knows, right? You're, you may need to debug that. So there's information there for that. There's also the collection of tasks, so that an admin or someone with the proper access rights can go in there and look at all the tasks running in the system. 
there's the collection of tasks, and then there's the task itself. That's where the task resource is, and it contains the attribute of the task, particularly when did it start, when did it stop, what state is it in, any warnings, any messages, that kind of thing. And then there's the task monitor, which there may be a pointer from the task resource to the task monitor, but it's not required. And that's only something we put in recently. So that task monitor might be associated with the task, but it might not. But it's sitting there with as something the client can sit there and pull on. Um, you can also subscribe to events. There's a, ta a, a task event as well. Um, but if you don't, you can just sit there and pull in a loop to get a 202. We're looking at that re retry after value for your back off algorithm. You know, if it says retry after 60 seconds, you wait another 60 seconds before you do your pull. Don't just sit there and pull in a tight loop. Um, and that task monitor contains not only the com uh, completion format, but you'll also get back the headers. You'll get back, um, um, obviously, the, the status code as if the um, request had been done synchronously. So here's a quick overview of the, the uh, model that I just described. You've got the service route hanging off of it is the task service. It's got a task collection and one or more or zero tasks that are currently underway. There is a task monitor property and task. That's a new thing we've added. So there may be a related resource to the task monitor. But the task monitor URI doesn't have to be slash redfish slash v1 slash whatever. It could technically be anything. So what does the task service look like? You know, we've got an overwrite policy and an eventing thing. You know, do I have that event um, happen when a task happens? Um, what happens to the task overwrite policy? Am I going to overwrite things? This means do I have to go in and manually delete any task resource or is it just going to disappear? Um, you got the task collections. Obviously, that's pretty important as well. The task itself, um, the task state, that's something anybody can go look in at and say, is this task still running? Is it completed? What time did it start? What time did it stop? What is the completion status? Is it okay, warning, critical, that kind of thing? And then were there any messages um, that were associated with that task? Those can come back in the task monitor as well, um, but they could also be in the task object. So, um, and these are any things that would get returned in the extended info section of the response body. The task monitor, well, I can't really show you a task monitor because I'd have to show you the request first. So, you know, if the request was a post of an action, that would be one kind of task monitor body. If, I sh if it was a long get or a firmware update, all of those bodies would be different, right? If I did a firmware update, I'd get a firmware update response body. If I did a action on a reset, I would probably get a, a null uh, response body. If I did a expanded get, it would be a really huge response body. So I can't really show you what one looks. But they've all got the same semantics. You pull until you do a two, get a 202. You, you back off based on retry. Once it's a 200 or a 400, you know, then you've got a response body just like the operation was synchronous. And the headers will be just like if, as if the response was synchronous. Um, so that's pretty important to remember. The task resource itself may still need to be deleted or the service may delete it. So um, that's something to remember. Once it's a non-202, you can only do one get on the task monitor. You just can't sit there and re-get it and re-get it, by the way. One get and it's gone. So be careful to hold on to that. Now the task resource um, may have that information as well. It's, it all depends on the implementation. So a request response example of a asynchronous operation. I do a post of an action. I got, uh, as a synchronous operation, I get a 204, content empty. So it was a reset, never saw a body. Same request, but results as an asynchronous operation. I do a post to that action target URI. I got a 202, accepted as returned. Okay, my location header has the task monitor URI. I've got a retry header, retry after header that says try after 30 seconds. And I got a response body that's returned, and it's a task resource. It's not an empty content. So I know I've got a task running. It's ID 1. Its state is running, and it's okay now. So I sit there and wait 30 seconds, and then I do another get. 202, check the retry after header. Sit there in a, in a loop on a while status code equal 202. And once it's not a 202, I drop out of my loop. Status code 204, content was empty, was returned. I know everything was good, and, and my action was ex, uh, accepted and completed correctly. I then still have that 
uh, task resource that's hanging around. And depending on the task service, you may have to go back and delete it or someone may have to go and delete it. And you got that back um, in the OData ID property you can see there in the task resource. So I know it's tasks one and I can go and, and delete that. We have a couple of new additions that are, are recent. One of those is there is a pointer, a property that has the URI of the task monitor. It's purely optional in an older implementation. It's not going to have it. There's also a payload object that is optional as well. And it contains a bunch of properties that have the original request. There's a hide payload property, and it may be set all the time by some implementations. So it may never return it in the response body. But that payload is there for systems that want to implement it. And that has a target URI property that has the original URI of the request, the HTTP operation, which is an enum of the HTTP operations that are allowed by Redfish, um, the, any headers that were supplied is the original payload, and then the JSON body, which has the original content of the body. And those are all optional and may be in there as well. That concludes the tutorial for tasks in Redfish. Um, as always, uh, visit the Redfish website for the latest information on the standard. Visit the developer hub for all the information you need um, on uh, Interactive Explorer, the schema, any changes you, uh, that have been added lately. And then, of course, there's the Redfish forum. That's the group that defines Redfish um, for the list of companies that are involved. Um, and consider joining Redfish. Um, you can also use the developer hub. There's a uh, an external forum that you can use to send feedback about Redfish to uh, the DMTF uh, for any changes or questions you have about Redfish. Thank you for your attention today. I appreciate it.